genetics prize in Australia from the Genetics Society of Australia. In 2005, she moved to Weehigh to work with Doug Hilton. And then in 2010, she established her own group in the medical medicine division at uh, Weehigh, uh, where she's been studying uh, epigenetic control and, uh, regular, and looking at molecular me mechanisms of epigenetic control in particular. She's got a, a list of awards. Notably, she was the uh, she obtained a QE2 in 2009. Uh, she had a great year in 2009, actually. She also got a lot of the Women's in Science Award. She uh, was, and note that importantly, uh, awarded the Gandhi Medal from the Australian Academy of Science for work into uh, research into genetics. And then just like she was received the inaugural Dyson Fellowship here at Weehai. So she's got a great um, pedigree in epigenetic research, and today is going to tell us the role this uh, important regulatory mechanism plays in uh, the development of cancer. So, um, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Peter. So, as you said, I'm going to talk today about um, epigenetic control and how it goes awry in, in cancer. So, I'm going to split the talk up into three sections. First of all, I'm going to move fairly quickly through an introduction to epigenetics and epigenetic modifications, just to keep, keep everybody on the same page, to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to go through some of the epigenetic modifications we know about and then run through a quick example of how these interact with one another to bring about epigenetic silencing or epigenetic activation. Then I want to spend some time talking about what happens to epigenetic marks in cancer cells and how they go wrong and, and what we know about them going wrong. Really the most is known about DNA methylation, um, but there is something known about some of these other epigenetic marks and how they are deregulated in cancer. And finally about the overexpression or mutations that are found actually in the epigenetic machinery themselves. And then I'll lead on finally to how these changes, these epi epigenetic changes which are found in cancer um, can be used in the clinic or can be taken advantage of in the clinic. So we'll start with the, what's known about um, it, what we know about epigenetics in general. So it was really back in the 1940s when Waddington first used this term epigenetics. And, and the prefix epi just means information that's in addition to. And it was clear at that time that there must be some information in addition to the genetic information. And that was because although um, they knew that the genetic information within the single cell egg, the, the zygote, was sufficient to direct the programming of an adult or an embryo as shown here, it really wasn't clear how you could have this one code, this one set of information, make so many hundreds of different cell types with all of their different functions. So they decided to use this word epigenetics, this information which must be there to help direct this, um, this, this differentiation. So we now understand that there's within each of these different cell types, there's the expression of restricted subsets of genes. And it's through this expression of different sets of genes within our genome that we can achieve these many different cell types with all of their different functions. So now um, we term epigenetics, or the definition that is most commonly used for epigenetics is a study of mitotically heritable changes in gene expression that don't alter DNA sequence. So it's really critical that these changes are mitotically heritable. So we know that Epigenetic changes or epigenetic control is important throughout development, through all of embryogenesis from fertilization onwards, through into the adult or the embryo and the adult into uh, for differentiation of specific lineages, for example, all the different lineages um, that are differentiated from the hematopoietic stem cell, um, and even through to the production of sperm and eggs, the gametes. So all these epi epigenetic marks are laid down within the lifetime of an organism and they're mitotically heritable and this is important because that means that a liver cell when it replicates will produce another liver cell with the same epigenetic modifications the same um, gene expression being directed but it's also important to note this break in the arrow here between um, the eggs and sperm and the next generation so epigenetic marks are laid down within a lifetime but are also absolutely required to be cleared between generations so you can think of it that you need to wipe the slate clean and, and remove the epigenetic marks which have been laid down in one lifetime before the next generation can proceed. So as you can see around the outside, um, when things go wrong with epigenetic control, it can result in a whole series of different problems, and just some of them are shown that I could fit in the slide here. But they include germ cell tumours and other types of tumours later in the adult. And that's, of course, what I'll come back to later today. So what do I mean by epigenetic modifications? Well... Really, what we're talking about is the accessibility of the chromatin to the transcriptional machinery. So how tightly packed the DNA is relates to whether or not the transcriptional machinery will be able to get access to the DNA. 
So we know this is a you know a very standard picture from a textbook, second year um, genetics textbook, and you can see that the DNA is packaged into the beads on a string as nucleosomes, and then you get higher and higher order packaging. So different epigenetic modifications are associated with different types of chromatin. So loosely packed chromatin or euchromatin houses active genes, whereas heterochromatin or densely packed chromatin houses inactive genes. And it's densely packed and therefore the RNA polymerase and the, uh, the rest of the transcriptional machinery is less likely to be able to access these genes. So I'm going to talk about mostly about three of the different epigenetic modifications today, mostly about DNA methylation, post-translational histone modifications and non-coding RNAs. But there are also histone variants. These are types of histones that can be incorporated into the nucleosome, which have different properties to the standard canonical histones. So say, for example, macro H2A has a macro domain, and this changes the features of the, the histone H2A and therefore changes the features of the nucleosome. And there are also chromatin remodeling um, complexes, which I won't go into very much today either. But suffice to say that in combination, all of the different epigenetic marks can influence chromatin remodeling and chromatin remodeling complexes are active complexes that use ATP to shift the nucleosomes around. So, as you can see on the beads on the string, nucleosomes can actually be removed by chromatin remodeling complexes or made to be packed more densely or more sparsely. And so, really, these are getting to the to the, the um, fundamental nature of the how um, accessible the DNA is. So, starting with DNA methylation, DNA methylation is the methylation of cytosine in mammals at the five prime group just shown here chemically. And it occurs almost exclusively in mammals at CPG dinucleotides. That just means the C followed by G, the P is just a phosphate bond. This, because it's a CG dinucleotide, they're symmetrical. So on the other strand of DNA, you'll also have a CG. And this means that it can be maintained through cell division. Because after, um, after the, the DNA has been replicated, the daughter strand will be unmethylated, but opposite on the parent strand, you'll have the methylation. And this hemimethylated DNA is recognized by DNA methyltransferase 1, which can then maintain this methylation pattern. And so it's very clear how DNA methylation can be maintained through mitosis, which, as you, as you remember, I said, is one of the really critical features of epigenetic marks. So methylation of the CPG island, which are, they're often found in the promoters of genes, is synonymous with silencing of gene expression. And we know that this DNA methylation can either interfere with particular transcription factors binding, and this is... Um, most notably the case for SP1, where it will not bind when the CPG site within its consensus sequence is methylated. But alternatively, it can lead to um, repressive chromatin structure by other means, which I'll come back to. So histone modifications are also covalent modifications, but now are made to the histones which package the DNA rather than the DNA itself. And they can, acetylation and methylation are the most uh, probably the best characterized. However, there are many different modifications which can be made including ubiquitination, phosphorylation, simulation, and ADP ribosylation. So these modifications tend to be made to the N-terminal or occasionally C-terminal tails of the histone. So here what you're looking at in blue is the DNA wrapped around the nucleosome. And so internal to that are the globular portions of the histones, and coming out to the outside are the histone tails. These are the N-terminal tails that are shown. Histone H2B, H2A, H4, and H3. So because these tails are on the outside of the nucleosome, they're accessible to the proteins that lay down or remove these epigenetic marks, so the acetyltransferases or deacetylases, the methyltransferases or demethylases, but they're also accessible to all of those proteins that read these epigenetic marks, okay? So the ones that use them as docking sites, if you like, which I'll also come back to. So as you notice, there are um, all of the ones that are potentially modifiable are shown with um, stars next to them, and there are a very, very large number of potentially modifiable sites in a nucleosome. And so it's been proposed that there's a histone code, because you can imagine there's an almost innumerable number of um, potential combinations, permutations and combinations of these particular marks. Not all of them occur, but we're starting to work out particular combinations mean particular things, and, and the ones that I'm interested in are ones when they mean activity, transcriptional activity, or transcriptional silencing. So how is it that these modifications to the DNA or modifications to the histone actually lead to changes in chromatin structure? Well, as I implied, these can be read by other chromatin proteins, and so the, the methylation of the cytosine or the methylation of the histone can act as a docking site for other proteins. And these other proteins, these chromatin proteins, can either um, move the nucleosomes around because they're chromatin remodelers, as I mentioned earlier. They might directly inhibit or promote the binding of RNA polymerase 2 and therefore have a direct effect on transcription. 
or they can bring about a series of other histone modifications which they themselves lead to differences in transcription. So histone acetylation is an easy one to remember, it correlates with transcriptional activity. But histone methylation um, is not so simple. It can either be associated with transcriptional activity or inactivity depending on its context. So you saw there are many, many different sites that could be modified and many of those can be mod modified by methylation. But just to remember a few, H3K4 diol trimethylation, so this is histone H3 lysine 4, the lysine 4 residue can be di or trimethylated and this is associated with active regions, whereas H3K9 diol trimethylation is associated with, associated with inactive regions and H3K9 is specifically associated or at least more commonly associated with constitutive heterochromatin. That's the heterochromatin which doesn't change. You can look at any cell type and it's always there and examples of this would be the centromere or the telomere. H3K27 trimethylation, this is the mark left by the polycomb group proteins or PRC2, for example, EZH2, which you may have heard about. This is again a transcriptionally inactive mark, but is now found at facultative heterochromatin. So that means heterochromatin which changes depending on the cell type you look at. So it could be a particular tissue-specific gene which is expressed in one cell type but inactive in another. And so in the inactive cell it could be marked by this H3K27 trimethylation. So then to summarise the first little bit I've told you, H3K4 diol trimethylation and histone acetylation are active marks, whereas H3K9 methylation, H3K27 methylation and DNA methylation are inactive marks. And this is important to remember when we come to discuss what's happening in a cancer cell. <coughs> so as I mentioned, the methylated histones or indeed the, um, or acetylated histones or phosphorylated um, tails can be docking sites for other proteins. And so various protein domains can bind to these different residues. Acetylated lysines are bound by bromo domains, whereas methylated lysines are bound by various different domains. If we take, for example, the chromo domain, a chromo domain is found in CHD1, which is an ATP-dependent chromatin remodeler, and it binds to H3K4 methylation, and it's known to be an activator. Whereas, if you look at H3K27, polycomb, uh, the methylated of H3K27 polycomb also contains a chromo domain, but is now an inactivator. And so the, the contr contribution of um, histone methylation is always context dependent. So I'll move on now quickly to the non-coding RNAs and very briefly mention the microRNAs. So as I said, non-coding RNAs come in two flavors, either microRNAs or small RNAs or long non-coding RNAs. I won't go into the large variety of small RNAs and just focus today on microRNAs. So there are hundreds of microRNAs encoded in the mammalian genome. And when they're transcribed, they have um, quite an extensive tertiary structure, and this is called a pre-microRNA. Drosha is an important enzyme which then cuts off this short hairpin RNA, um, which you may have heard about from um, people who use these short hairpin RNAs a lot in research. Um, and then Drosha cuts off the short hairpin and it's then exported from the nucleus. And this short hairpin RNA is then subject to DISA-dependent um, digestion of the, the hairpin off the end, so you just get left with the siRNA portion and it's then incorporated into the risk complex. So the microRNAs in the end produce a 22 nucleotide RNA and it's involved in post-transcriptional silencing. So the mRNA has already been made and then these short RNAs come back and they inhibit the translation of that molecule. So in mammals, it's most commonly thought that these microRNAs bind to the three prime untranslated region of the messenger RNA and thereby inhibit translation, although in some instances, they can lead to um, mRNA degradation. So each microRNA actually pairs with mismatches and therefore each microRNA can target many genes or many messenger RNAs rather than just one. They're expressed in a developmentally controlled manner. So they have um, promoters like most other genes and they can also be subject to normal sorts of promoter control, epigenetic control of when they're expressed. And they've been shown over the last 10 years or so to have really critical roles in differentiation and development. Long non-coding RNAs are far more controversial than microRNAs and they've been more recently discovered, or at least the, far, the bulk of them have been more recently discovered. And how exactly they contribute to epigenetic control um, is still controversial. So these long non-coding RNAs are greater than 200 nucleotides in length. They're constrained to the nucleus and again they're expressed in a developmentally controlled manner. So they too can be um, expressed in tissue-specific ways. And interestingly, they seem to be able to regulate epigenetic processes in many different ways. And this can happen in cis, so um, at the very location from which they're transcribed, or in trans. 
So I'm going to go through both of these examples later in the talk. But at this stage, I just want to mention that there are the, perhaps the most famous long non-coding RNA ex is EXIST, which is involved in exon activation. There are other long non-coding RNAs involved in genomic imprinting and Hox gene silencing and also downstream of P53. And here in this picture is just showing the many different ways that these non-coding RNAs we know about so far can actually bring, be involved in epigenetic control. So they can nucleate, um, so here in, in red, the little hairpinny thing is the long non-coding <coughs> RNA, and green is the um, chromatin remodeling complex or some sort of epigenetic um, complex, and the DNA is shown in blue. So here they can nucleate um, uh, a, the, the, the epigenetic complex to form a small body within the nucleus. Here, when this is a, a cis effect, where when as the long non-coding <coughs> RNA is being transcribed, it actually recruits particular chromatin remodeling complexes to the DNA. Here, the long non-coding RNA can act as a scaffold. Here, it's contributing to looping, DNA looping of the chromatin. And finally, here, it's, it's showing what happens in paraspeckles, where the long non-coding RNA in cis brings in many different complex components, and so that you actually get a, a physically detectable paraspeckle within the nucleus. So, what I'd like to do now is just quickly run through one example of epigenetic <coughs> silencing to show you how all of these different marks contribute to, to silencing. And, and what I'm going to go through is exon activation because it's what I know most amount about. And it also means that I can get to tell you about all of these different marks. So exon activation is the silencing of one of the two X chromosomes in female cells. And this is because you need to have dosage compensation between a female which has two X chromosomes and a male which has one so that you don't have a double dose of all X-linked genes. So this is known to be an epigenetic mechanism, and the second X chromosome is densely packaged down in the female cell um, and is epigenetically inactivated. This epigenetic inactivation um, is mitotically heritable, like all other epigenetic marks that I've told you about, and it occurs um, at random. The choice of which X chromosome is inactivated occurs at random and happens about gastrulation, so about E5.5 in mice. So, this inactive X shows the hallmarks of many of the um, many heterochromatic regions in, in the nucleus. It shows exist long non-coding RNA is bound, shows low levels of histone acetylation, as you might expect, and an accumulation of repressive marks, and finally, DNA methylation of the CPG islands. But how does this come, come about? Well, the first thing that happens is the long non-coding RNA. So exist is the first described long non-coding RNA, and it's 17 kb in length. And really, this is the critical factor for exon activation to be initiated, is this long non-coding RNA. It's then expressed from the chromosome, which will become inactive. So it is slightly counterintuitive, and this is shown here by RNA fish on just one of the chromosomes in this metaphase spread. So it's expressed from the chromosome, which will become inactive, and then it coats that chromosome in cis. <coughs> so what we now know about how this works is that there's an initiation phase, which is involved with exist being expressed. And then somehow EXIST establishes a silent nuclear compartment. And this is a compartment towards the nuclear periphery where no RNA polymerase enters. And so this is obviously going to contribute to the silencing of this particular chromosome. Following that, there's the removal of the active histone mark, so removal of acetylation and H3K4 trimethylation, and then recruitment of silencing complexes, for example, the polycomb group of proteins, um, including EZH2, and these lay down repressive chromatin marks. And then it moves into a maintenance phase once this is a, once the silencing is established, and this, this involves binding of smooch D1, which is the protein we found and work on, and macro H2A, a histone variant I mentioned earlier, and finally DNA methylation of the CPG islands on the inactive X. And so the DNA methylation is thought to lock in this silent state because it's one of the only cases where we know that we, it's a, there's a, um, a very sensible mechanism that you can come up with about how this this um, epigenetic mark is maintained through mitosis. So in total, all of these epigenetic marks work together. They build upon one another. And so in the end, you end up with very stable inactivation of that X chromosome, which will be mitotically heritable and will last the lifetime of the organism. So just as a very quick summary, you can see euchromatin has nucleosomes that are further positioned further apart, active genes, histone acetylation and H3K4 trimethylation, whereas heterochromatin has DNA methylation, the nucleosomes located closer together, and other types of histone methylation, and these genes are found in these regions are inactive. So then, what happens in cancer cells? Well, as I said before, the most is known about DNA methylation, and that's because it's been easier to study, and it was um, in terms of the amount of cells that you require. We know a little bit about histone marks and microRNAs, and one thing about long non-coding RNAs, and um, we also know that many of the uh, epigenetic 
components of the epigenetic machinery are actually misexpressed in cancer. So at the very simplest of levels, if you look in a normal cell, here I'm showing the CPGs by, as lollipops, and green means they're unmethylated and red means they're methylated. So in a normal cell, the CPG island at the start of a gene and the promoter of the gene is unmethylated, and this will mean that RNA pol 2 combined and it's active. Whereas if you look through the rest of the genome at the repetitive elements and um, within the gene, these regions are CPG poor, but where there are CPGs, they tend to be methylated. If we then look at a cancer cell, these cells frequently, you frequently observe the methylation of the CPG island, and this is particularly seen for the tumor suppressor genes. And so tumor suppressor genes can be switched off by DNA methylation. Whereas if you look throughout the rest of the genome, these now are hypomethylated. So in cancer, you see tumor suppressor hypermethylation within the context of genome-wide hypomethylation. So if we go first to tumor suppressor hypermethylation, if you think about what you've learned about cancer, it has to happen by um, inactivation of tumor suppressor genes and activation of oncogenes. And you've heard that this can be achieved genetically, and you probably heard a fair bit about that last week, but it can also be achieved epigenetically. So you remember that these, mitotic, these epigenetic marks are mitotically heritable. So it's now very well recognized that DNA methylation can actually contribute to silencing of tumor suppressor genes. These silent tumor suppressor genes can then be selected for just as genetic mutations would be because these epigenetic mutations are also quite stable. Epi mutations are stable. But the really important thing is that epi mutations, unlike genetic mutations, are reversible. And this is where it comes uh, is important when we think about therapy or epigenetic therapy. So there are three, I think, important facts to remember about tumor suppressor hypermethylation. The first is that you don't just tend to see one um, tumor suppressor that's hypermethylated within a particular cell or particular tumor type, but rather there are sets of genes. And these sets of genes vary by tumor type, which is likely to be because different tumor suppressors have different roles in each tumor. You also know, we also know that in particular cases, these epimutations are more frequent than genetic mutations, and that's somewhat surprising. But it tells you about how important they are in driving the, the tumor forward. And finally, these epimutations, these tumor suppressor hypermethylation events, appear early in tumorigenesis. And this has been studied by looking at the neighborhood effect. If you look nearby in the normal tissue that's adjacent to the tumor tissue, they also often display similar, although not complete, epigenetic um, changes. So um, these epigenetic silencing of, the, of genes can have direct or indirect effects on tumorigenesis. Retinoblastoma was the first gene that was found to be hypermethylated back in 1989. We know MLH1, BRCA1, and MG, MGMT are involved in DNA repair, and so they have direct effect when they're silenced, whereas RUNX3, um, GATA4, and GATA5 are uh, transcription factors, so when they're silenced, they have more indirect effects on um, gene expression because it's their targets which will be changed, and these targets have a role in cancer. Interestingly, I'm just going to bring this up very briefly. MLH1 is not only found to be um, methylated within the tumor cells, but in rare instances, can be found constitutionally. So in other words, in all the cells of an individual. And this has been termed either constitutional epimutation or germline epimutation. And there are some very interesting circumstances where this appears to run in families, but without um, them finding DNA mutations that seem to be responsible for these epimutations. And so this brings up the possibility of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. I'm not going to go into that any further today, but it's a really interesting topic to talk about. So as I said, you tend to get sets of genes which are hypermethylated, and in some particular cancers, we have there's a particular syndrome which is known as CPG island methylator phenotype, or SIMP. And this was first described in colorectal cancer, but it has now been described in other instances as well. And this is where you find a really high frequency of genes that are found to be hypermethylated in their promoters. So what's interesting about this is that, they, that these tumors that display SIMP have clinically distinct phenotypes. So in the case of colorectal cancer, They've got defective MLH1, older patient age, they're predominantly females, microsatellite instability. They have tumours particularly in the ascending colon, and interestingly, they have a good prognostic outcome, and that's perhaps one of the most important things in this case. And because each of these SIMP cases, not only in colorectal cancer, but also in the other cases, have clinically distinct features, it has implications for how epigenetic therapy might happen in these cases. <coughs> What's also really interesting is that the genes that become hypermethylated in SIMP tend to be the ones which are targeted by the polycomb group protein in ES cells, so decades beforehand. So this implies that there's some interaction between these different complexes, and somehow the genes that were targets of the polycomb group proteins are somehow um, 
primed for silencing in cancer. And this is really interesting. So, as I said, you have tumor suppressor hypermethylation, but this happens in the context of genome-wide hypomethylation, so a low level of methylation. So, in fact, this is one of the earliest um, events that's, occur that's observed in cancer cells when you look um, very early on in tumor genesis, but was also chronologically observed in the 70s, so we've known about it for a very, very long time. It occurs at the repeats, which I mentioned earlier, but also CPG-poor promoters. Not every promoter is a CPG island. Introns and gene deserts. And we now understand that it can contribute to tumor genesis in two ways. The first way is by increasing genomic instability. So if you decrease the methylation of repeats or retrotransposons, then you can increase chromosomal rearrangements or you can mobilize retrotransposons. And clearly, this has um, uh, bad consequences. This has been shown in mice in um, models of hypermethylation. For example, if you delete the DNMT1 gene by knockout. But it's also shown in humans where if you have a mutation in DNMT3B, this results, which is a de novo methyltransferase, this results in chromosomal instability in a particular syndrome. Although there's also evidence from many human cancers that um, low levels of methylation will increase genomic instability. The second way that um, this hypomethylation can lead, uh, can contribute to tumor genesis is by activating genes. So tumor suppressor hypermethylation silences genes, but sometimes you can have genes that are activated in this way, and they tend to be tissue-specific genes, imprinted genes, or indeed sometimes microRNAs. So RAS is activated in gastric cancer by hypomethylation. IGF2 is important in growth promotion, and normally it's imprinted. So of the two alleles that you inherit, inherit one from your mum, one from your dad, it's normally only expressed from one of these, and it's determined from the parent of origin. So, but when you lose hypermethylation, you, you lose the methylation, both copies then become active, and you have twice the dose of this growth promoter as, as what you should. And so this is associated with Wilms tumour, but is also found in other tumours as well. So it's kind of a bit confusing that you have hypermethylation of some places and hypomethylation genome-wide. So how is it that DNA methylation actually contributes overall to tumor genesis? Well, again, just like, say, I said histone methylation is context-dependent, the role of DNA methylation seems to be context-dependent depending on the cancer that you look at. And so we know that in mice, if you delete DNMT1, the, methyl histone, the, the DNA methyltransferase, the maintenance DNA methyltransferase, this can have different consequences. It can either suppress or enhance tumorigenesis. And now it's beginning to be understood that this is because different tumors have different dependencies. They could be driven, driven by the tumor suppressor hypermethylation, or they could be driven by the chromosomal instability. So if you deplete DNA methylation in one of these cases, which is driven by tumor suppressor hypermethylation, this will, of course, suppress the tumorigenesis. But if you deplete it when it's driven by chromosomal instability and it's going to enhance the chromosomal instability, it'll, of course, make the tumors um, appear more rapidly. So this, again, has implications for how we could use epigenetic therapies because there would be different consequences of, for example, inhibiting DNA methylation in particular tumor types. So that's all about DNA methylation, but what about histone modification? So here are the histone tails shown in a different picture mostly the N-terminal tails, but also a couple of C-terminal tails with two residues that can be modified. And the ones that are shown with lightning bolts here are the ones that are found to be changed in cancer. We don't know as much about histone modifications altering in cancer because the techniques to look at histone modifications require far larger, larger numbers of cells. But what we do know is that the active mark, um, acetylation of H4K16, is lost genome-wide, as is methylation of H4K20, which is an inactive <coughs> mark. So genome-wide, you lose these two marks. And these are lost at the same places where you see DNA hypomethylation. So there's really the interaction between histone modifications and DNA methylation once again. But also on the, on the um, histone H3 tail, at tumor suppressor genes where you observe DNA hypermethylation, <coughs> you also see a loss of active marks, so H3K9 acetylation, H3K4 trimethylation, and the gain of inactive marks, such as H3K9 methylation and H3K27 trimethylation. And as I said, these seem to collaborate with the DNA methylation changes. So in addition to these um, gene-specific effects or genome-wide effects, in fact, we've learned over the last five years ago through really great research that's been done in Australia in Sue Clark's lab at the Garvin, that these epigenetic changes aren't really restricted to, to small regions. We see them at the gene level. So here's the promoter region again with the lollipop seeing DNA methylation. So we see in cancer hypermethylation, for example, and then concomitant changes in the histone marks. But we can also see long-range epigenetic silencing. 
So here they call them the neighbourhood level. So here the, the genes are shown as circles rather than the CPG islands, rather than, sorry, the CPG nucleotide. And so you can see methylated suburbs, whole regions of genes that are methylated or unmethylated, and um, the methylated ones are different to what would happen in the normal cell. Or indeed, a whole chromosome band, which is what's reported in this publication, can be um, aberrantly silenced. And more recently, they've shown that this also happens not only um, in, in almost any epigenetic mark that you can look at. So this is important because epigenetic marks, it's been shown, it's been known for, for decades really, that epigenetic marks have the ability to spread through the neighbouring region. And that's because as you recruit different chromatin remodeling complexes, different epigenetic machinery, they can also meth methylate the neighbouring nucleosome. And so they inherently spread out unless there's an insulator in the way. And so the same sort of thing is happening in the cancer cells. And so it really changes the way that we think about the epigenome and how um, significantly it's altered within cancer cells. So I'm going to briefly say, I talk about microRNAs. MicroRNAs are frequently misexpressed in cancer. They're most predominantly silenced. However, sometimes they're also found to be activated. And really, the role of the microRNA depends on its target. So here are just a few examples, or there are a, a whole slew more than this. We know that microRNA 15 and 16 target BCL2, the pro-survival protein. And so when microRNA 15 and 16 are silenced in CLL, obviously this will contribute to tumor genesis. Down here, microRNA 101 targets EZH2, which is one of the um, epigenetic components which I mentioned earlier. It's a polycomb group protein. It's part of PRC2. So if microRNA 101 is silenced, then you get overexpression of EZH2, and this is found in bladder carcinoma although EZH2 is misexpressed in, in almost all cancers that have now been studied where it's been looked for. Interestingly, the enzymes that are actually involved in microRNA processing, Drosher and Dysa, which I mentioned earlier, are also deregulated in some cancer. And this would mean that microRNAs in general would be deregulated within those cancers rather than just specific ones being silenced or activated. So I want to talk just very briefly about hot air, which is a long non-coding RNA that's been um, found first in 2007, and it's still extremely controversial, but the role of non-coding RNAs, both in normal cells and cancers, um, appears to be right back at the initiation of epigenetic silencing, and so really critical for us to understand. So hot air is um, transcribed from the HOX-C cluster, but actually acts in trans on the HOX-D cluster. And this is the first non-coding RNA um, described to act in trans rather than in cis. When it does this, it binds to PRC2, which I just mentioned, poly polychrome repressive complex 2, including EZH2, and also has been recently shown at the other end of the non-coding RNA to bind LSD1, which is a demethylase. It removes an active mark. So you have two different enzymes being brought in by this long non-coding RNA. It's acting as a bit of a molecular scaffold to target to a particular region, to, to make a particular region silent. So it's said to act as a molecular scaffold. Interestingly, last year there was a report that hot air was overexpressed in breast cancer, and this was associated with metastasis. In this case, what they've shown is in vitro, if you overexpress hot air, this is sufficient to actually reprogram the epigenome of these cells, and they end up looking like um, embryonic fibroblasts. So, although in these other studies it's been shown to act in trans, transcribed from HOXC cluster, acts on HOXD. In this case, because you can reprogram the whole genome, just by overexpressing hot air in these cancer cells, it suggests that hot air has targets other than the HOXD locus and suggests that it's not going to be just by the actual um, base sequence that it will be targeted to DNA. And this is absolutely fascinating, or at least I find it fascinating. It's going to be through this long non-coding RNA which we can actually alter how the epigenome looks. So how is it that we can have all these different modifications, all these different changes in the cancer cells? So certainly in some cases it will just be through a natural evolution and selection sort of process, an epigenetic mistake that happens, and then that mistake happens to have consequences for cell division or replication rate or whatever. But there must be something more. As I mentioned earlier, Drosher and Dysa are found to be um, aberrantly regulated, so if components of the epigenetic machinery are aberrantly re regulated. But in fact, this is not a comprehensive list, but it's, uh, many of all of these genes are found to be deregulated in cancer in one way or another, plus more that you can't fit on the slide. So histone demethylases, histone deacetylases, histone acetyltransferases, histone methyltransferases, DNA methyltransferases, and ones that bind DNA methylation, chromatin remodeling complexes, and even the proteins that bind to the modified histone, for example. All of these are changed, and they're changed in many different ways. They can either show loss of function or gain of function, so either through 
um, loss of function by translocation or by deletion or by mutation, but also by CPG hypomethylation, so if aberrant epigenetic silencing. They can, in gain of function, they can be amplified or can be overexpressed. What's interesting is the particular um, epigenetic regulator that you find to be mutated or aberrantly um, regulated in some way tends to be different when you look at different cancers. So you don't always find um, all of these things to happen. It may be because we haven't actually looked at them all yet, or it may be that, that just like with the tumor suppressor gene hypomethylation, you will find a restricted subset that are aberrantly regulated within each case because of the different reliance upon each of these different components. What's really interesting, or I find fascinating, is that EZH2 can be found, is most commonly known to be amplified in solid tumors. But in fact, it's recently found last year that it can also be mutated in some instances, and these are in the hematological malignancies, in lymphoma, but also myelodysplastic syndrome. So this would suggest that in some instances it acts as a tumor suppressor, but in other instances it acts as an oncogene. So how is it that the one molecule could act in these completely opposing ways? Well, again, we've got to remember that the, the um, genes or the target genes for each of these complexes is likely to be cell type specific. And again, it's the target genes which will have the direct effect on tumorogenesis. So different target genes will, that may be uh, upregulated in this case because it's a silencer would mean that you're going to have a different consequence for, for the cell. So in combination, what I've told you is that the epigenetic marks, we see global hypomethylation and promoter-specific hypermethylation. And through these epigenetic changes, sometimes you can have you, you could have an increase in chromosomal instability, which could contribute to the genetic changes you see in cancer. But additionally, we see genetic changes in the epigenetic modifiers themselves that contribute to the epigenetic changes. It's now thought that the epigenetic changes are some of the earliest events that occur in cancer. But together, these epigenetic changes and the genetic changes can contribute to the formation of the cancer. So how can we use this knowledge about the aberrant epigenetic control for, um, so that we can actually use it in a clinic? There are two ways that I want to talk about. First of all, these epigenetic changes to use them as biomarkers. And secondly, how um, we can target these epigenetic changes and, and introduce epigenetic therapy. So, um, in terms of epigenetic biomarkers, we can use them in three ways. So these hypermethylation that is observed in almost every tumour at a particular subset of genes within each tumour, and this tends to be quite tumour type specific, can be used to detect tumours. We can also look at the methylation of particular genes, and, and this has a relevance to prognosis, and finally can use it to predict therapy. I'll go through each of these in a little more detail. So, What's interesting to note is that although you can detect these epigenetic changes in the tumours, and therefore when you perform a biopsy or the tumour is resected, but also it can be observed in fluids. So in some cases you're able to observe changes that occur um, in um, irrelevant biological tissue. Say for example in lung cancer, in the sputum you can detect epigenetic changes in the DNA that's found in that. And one of the reasons you can, you can observe these changes is because we're looking at cases where you see tumor suppressor hypermethylation, and it's a very sensitive way to detect the methylation amongst the context of normal cells. So the normal cells would never methylate that particular site or those particular genes. So even if you observe a low frequency of methylation with a sensitive enough technique, this is indicative um, that there could be aberrant cells in that sample. So this methylation measurements can happen for single markers or for panels of markers, or indeed for now are being discussed to be used global um, measures of, of epigenetic profiles. Perhaps the, um, the best example so far is, of the, is the hypermethylation of GSTP1 in prostate cancer. So this is a very sensitive measure because this hypermethylation is only found in neoplastic tissue. It's not found in aberrant um, hyperplastic tissue within the prostate. And so if you measure this methylation, you're able to detect it in the urine samples and therefore it's non-invasive and, and um, is in fact very sensitive. This um, can be actually improved if you use a panel of genes. So rather than just one gene, many groups are using up to 15 or 20 genes because, again, they usually are many genes that are hypermethylated within particular tumor types, and this increases your sensitivity. The only real problem with measuring methylation is that because it is such an early marker, it, that can be a benefit or a problem. It can be a benefit because it means you can detect the tumorigenic cells or the cells that may become tumorigenic very early, and so you have the opportunity to um, take appropriate um, courses of action. However, you don't, you can't really predict whether it's just a normal part of aging, and so whether this person really, really, true, truly will go on and develop tumour. 
assume it. This isn't so much the case for GSTP1, but for many of the other markers that are being looked at at the moment. Secondly, looking at these um, tumours or biopsies can be used for prognosis. So in some particular instances, methylation of particular genes is associated with a particular outcome. And one example is methylation of these particular microRNAs is associated with metastasis. And that's a really important thing to know. If you look at two samples and they look effectively the same, you need to be able to determine and tell the patient whether you think this might be a very aggressive tumour or one which might be indolent for a long period of time. And finally, if you look at the methylation of particular genes, this can help you to predict whether or not a tumour might respond to therapy, just in the same way that people can do um, pharmacogenetics and they can test the mutations in particular genes. You can test whether a particular gene is hypermethylated and switched off. So in the case of MGMT and glioma, it would normally be a very poor prognostic outcome if you have hypermethylated MGMT. However, this actually means that hypermethylation of MGMT and therefore switching off of MGMT means that the cells are particularly sensitive to this drug, temozolomide. And so if this test is brought into practice, then they'll be able to stratify the patients that might be able to really respond to this particular chemotherapy. So because these epigenetic changes are, um, although they are heritable, mitotically heritable, they are also flexible. They can be removed again. So unlike DNA mutations, which obviously can't be removed, one of the drives to make epigenetic drugs is the fact that these are inherently reversible. So here's a whole battery of drugs that are available that target all of the different components of the epigenetic machinery. And at the moment, there's a massive drive by the pharmaceutical industry to have more drugs that target the epigenetic machinery. But so far, only four have been approved by the FDA. So they are two DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, which were um, approved in 2004 and 2006. And these are both base analogs, and they've been um, approved for myelodysplastic syndrome that's progressed to acute leukemia. And two have been approved, histone deacetylase inhibitors, which were approved in 2006, um, first, and I'm not sure when the second one was approved, for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And this is actually a very rare T-cell lymphoma. So in both cases, for DNA methyltransferase inhibitors and for histone deacetylase inhibitors, the ultimate goal is to get the neoplastic cells to either differentiate or apoptose. But this can happen through many different mechanisms, and most of them we don't yet understand. They seem, tend to be non-specific in their mechanism of action. So they can, of course, induce differentiation or apoptosis directly, but they can also have many other changes in the cell. So to, I'll describe DNA methylation inhibitors. So as I said, they're base analogs, and they get incorporated into the DNA. And then when the DNA methyltransferase comes along, um, the DNA methyltransferase 1 comes along, it binds to this base analog irreversibly, and so it basically um, ties up that DNA methyltransferase and it can't be used anymore. So the overall effect is with cell division, you end up having a lower level of DNA methylation. So um, they were first introduced several decades ago and they were used at really high um, doses, these base analogues, and they were found to be at that point, they were cytotoxic, but not actually, they didn't actually have a really great anti-neoplastic effect and so they, they weren't continued. However, more recently, I think 1994 or 95, they were introduced again and used at much lower doses and at these lower doses, they were found to have a much greater antineoplastic effect, and that was at the range when they could actually observe DNA demethylation, so when they were having on-target effects, if you like. So there are several problems with these drugs. Um, the biggest one is probably acquired resistance. Every cancer that is treated with DNA methyltransferase inhibitors acquire resistance to these drugs. And at the moment, the ones that are used all have the same mechanism of action, so you can't um, come at them with another DNA methyltransferase inhibitor right now. There are new drugs being developed which have different mechanisms, which are instead small molecule inhibitors um, of the DNA methyltransferases rather than base analogs. But in general, they have a lack of specificity, which is inherent to their mode of action. So while you're wanting to decrease the methylation of tumor suppressor genes, you'll also be decreasing the methylation of all other genes in the genome in theory. And so we don't know what the long-term effects of this might have on the person that's being treated because they haven't been being used in the clinic for long enough yet. We also don't really know, is demethylation actually sufficient to reactivate genes? So in any of the gene expression studies that have been performed before treatment and after treatment, you really don't see very many big changes occurring. As you remember, I said that their epigenetic modifications all come together to contribute to DNA to silencing. And so just to remove the final one, demethylation, which is usually thought to be a late mark, may not actually be sufficient to bring about gene reactivation. So it's been proposed that these DNA methylation inhibitors may actually be having their effect by non-demethylation mechanisms that we don't yet understand. The other thing I wanted to bring up was, as I mentioned earlier, 
the effect of DNA methylation depends on the, um, the dependency of that tumour, whether it's chromosomal instability or tumour suppressor hypermethylation. So why is it that so far they seem to have been most effective in hematological malignancies? Is that because these ones are dependent on tumour suppressor hypermethylation, whereas others are dependent on chromosomal instability? I think as more, um, more time progresses and more trials are performed in solid tumours, this will, this will fall out. So histone deacetylase inhibitors, whereas we only had one class of DNA methyltransferase inhibitors <coughs> at the moment, and the others are still very much in development, um, there are four classes of histone deacetylase inhibitors. And it's not only that cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, which has been approved for, but they also appear in more recent trials to be effective against other lymphoid malignancies. In this case, they also tend to have non-specific effects because they don't only inhibit histone deacetylases but also pro other protein deacetylases which are found in the cytoplasm. So we don't really understand their precise mechanism of action. Is it nuclear or is it cytoplasmic? It's really unknown at this point. But I think what is interesting is that in the, the studies that have been performed, there is a synergism between histone deacetylase inhibitors and DNA methyltransferase inhibitors. So as I said, just removing one of these marks may not necessarily be sufficient to reactivate the genes that you're aiming to reactivate. But if you can use them in combination, perhaps, or in combination with standard chemotherapeutics, that is where we really might be able to get the largest effect in tumorigenesis. And of course, with the additional drugs that are going to be that are being used to target the histone demethylases, the histone methyltransferases, and many of the other complex components, it's perhaps in the combination of these drugs when we can see um, the greatest therapeutic benefit. So I'm going to leave it there, and I'll just hope that I've, I'll just summarise and say that I hope I've told you a little bit about epigenetics. I've told you about the main aberrations that are seen in um, cancer cells and about how this is clinically important, how they can, these epigenetic ch changes can act as biomarkers and also these epigenetic changes are reversible. And so we should, in theory, be able to target them to be removed again um, and return the cell to a somewhat normal state. Um, last of all, here are four reviews that I think are all very good. They're very repetitive. One is very much like the other, but if you want to do some further reading, I'd recommend all of these. Thanks. Thanks, Marty. Um, I will get questions in the crowd. And Marty, if you could repeat them so the video camera can sure. record the questions. So, go ahead, guys. None? Oh, here we go. Sorry. All these uh, drugs from do not look uh, very, very specific to me. And uh, what is important, like uh, the people who talk about the work at home. And uh, about the combination, the relation that using them as combination is uh, beneficial. But isn't that true because that kills the cells almost uh, most specifically? So Philippe's question is that we don't know very much about the epigenetic drugs and so to combine them maybe they work better just because you get more death. And I think that's absolutely the case. There haven't really been, um, at least that I've read, there haven't been sufficient studies to show that you get epigenetic reprogramming when you use these drugs that should target the epigenetic machinery. And certainly for the histone deacetylase inhibitors they seem to be great drugs, but I think mostly they're working at a cytotoxic level and mostly working in the cytoplasm, and the studies haven't been there yet to, to work out why it is that they're working. But in theory, I think, if they get the dose right, they could, they would be more beneficial together, and, they, and, and but why they are at the moment in the trials that have been done is not clear, other than death. Is there some hope that we can uh, either silence or reactivate some specific genes in the future? Yeah, so that's, a, again, is there some hope that we could um, take particular genes and somehow target them for silencing or target them for activation? So the best case that I know about at the moment is where they're using methylated oligonucleotides specific for a gene, actually specific for IGF-2. So this is the gene where they had hypomethylation and you got activation of the second allele of that gene. So when you use a methylated oligonucleotide, it forms a triplex with the DNA and then targets that for DNA methylation um, the problem with that is, of course, it's particularly with IGF-2, if it happens on both alleles, you're going to be equally poorly off because then you're going to have silencing of both alleles and no IGF-2. So how you have get that to happen in a case where it's an imprinted gene, I'm not entirely sure. But in any case, yes, they, they're trying these methylated oligonucleotides. Pardon? Uh, how is the histone modification uh, inherited? That's a fantastic question. Um, in most cases, the answer is they don't know. But for histone methylation, um, so certainly for the polychrome group of proteins, um, the way that this happens is that the polychrome repressive complex is found at the replication fork. 
And so somehow, so the and the hist not not necessarily the enzyme itself, so not necessarily EZH2 in the case of PRC2, but other complex components, they are able to both recognize their own mark and make that mark. So it's thought, um, it's actually very controversial between two groups in the world, but what's proposed is that it binds to the mark on one, some of the histones that are still maintained, still retained during the replication or are nearby, and then it makes it um, afresh on the other histones that are being incorporated. Right, yeah. um, there are different examples of resistance to different therapies found in the histone. So, is there other examples where um, resistance to particular therapies, in particular tyrosine kinase inhibitors, is due to silencing of the gene by hypermethylation? I actually don't know of the specific examples, but I'm sure that there are. So do you mean IPS cells? Yes. Yep. So induced pluripotent stem cells. So to in order to make so yes, there are absolutely epigenetic mechanisms contributing to that. So we know that when you take um, a somatic cell and reprogram it to become um, a pluripotent cell, an induced pluripotent cell, this requires epigenetic changes. Um, if you take X inactivation again as an example, you start off in a female cell with one inactive X and through the reprogramming you come back and an IPS cell has two active X chromosomes. And the marks have been sufficiently clear that when you ask that IPS cell to differentiate again, it chooses at random the X to inactivate. So it's not necessarily the one that the parent cell had. So that's a nice example where the where reprogramming is complete. There have also been screens that have been performed to try and find what are the components in addition to um, the overexpression of pluripotency factors, for example, that are required. Um, and it's been shown that many of the different components of the epigenetic machinery enhance the reprogramming um, to IPS cells. I have a, a structural question. The histone tail, where all this action's going on, it's always drawn as just a string. So structurally, is that the case? It's just a platform? Or is it some modifications can enhance structural or repress structure in, in this region of the protein? So the question is whether um, the histone tail is drawn as a long line and, you know, just like it's floating around in space, and is there actually any structure to it or can some of the modifications that are made to it alter its structure? Um, my understanding, although, again, I'm not a structural biologist, so I don't really have any idea, but um, my understanding is that they are fairly free to move around and so that when they um, do look at the structures, they don't find particular folding. I imagine that um, various modifications must constrain it in some way whether or not that contributes um, to the stability, I'm not sure. Whereas the histones, the histone variants, which have different domains, certainly have different stabilities and contribute to the, the structure of the nucleosome. So that's probably a similar, similar mechanism. Are there any further questions? Well, in that case, just think, uh, remains to thank Marty again for an excellent <laughs>